This is just a short review of graphs of common functions. Uh, in this video, we'll be focused with preparing you for calculating areas and volumes um, in the near future. But this can actually help out with other concepts in calculus, such as finding limits. So let's get started. We have 17 different types of functions we'll look at briefly. Maybe highlight just a few characteristics. So the first is probably the first function you learned about, our linear function. Um, you may recall linear functions being written in the form uh, y equals mx plus b, kind of our slope-intercept form there. And um, typically we can talk about domain being all real numbers, range being all real numbers, and they're pretty friendly. Domain and range being all real numbers, of course, um, would be for a non-horizontal and non-vertical linear function, so a function with uh, a slope other than zero or undefined. Um, probably the second type of function you learned how to graph were polynomials. And this in particular is polynomials of even degree. So y equals x squared giving us our nice parabola shape. And then that end behavior seen in the picture here being true of all even degree polynomials. So either both ends are going to face up if the leading coefficient is positive or both ends are going to um, face down if the leading coefficient is negative. So in terms of end behavior, both ends of the function are doing the same thing. So polynomials of even degree, pretty friendly. Just a reminder that the number of turning points in a polynomial is one less than the degree. So for example, if I thought about um, y equals x to the fourth, some variation on that um, degree 4 function, we could have uh, at most three turning points. So one less than the degree. So a turning point would be considered a place where you're changing from a decreasing to increasing slope or from increasing to decreasing. So just something to note there um, regarding turning points. That discussion also carries over to polynomials of odd degree. So when your polynomial has an odd degree as the highest power, the ends of the graph, the long-term uh, end behavior, will do opposite things. So if your leading coefficient is positive, the ends of your graph will look like so. If the leading coefficient is negative, that just switches around. So things like y equals x cubed, y equals x to the fifth, um, etc. And we tend to focus mostly on cubics, um, so that's basically what's sketched here in red. Now we'll look at root functions. Just as we broke down polynomials by even and odd degrees, we'll look at roots by even and odd as well. So our root functions are our radical functions, um, our square root of x, of course, being most common. And in terms of domain, we automatically see there's a restriction here. Um, for your just basic square root function, your domain starts at zero and includes zero, and then continues indefinitely. Um, similarly, the range starts at zero and continues indefinitely towards infinity. So that is our even root function. The domain and range will sh shift depending upon any transformations within the function. So odd roots, things like cube root of x, fifth root of x, um, the domain is not restricted now since it's okay to have a negative number under an odd root. So for example, the cube root of negative 27 is negative 3. With the previous type of function, we know the square root of a number like negative 9 is really going to involve our imaginary number. So that's why in the previous example we didn't look at um, negative numbers in the domain. So with our odd roots, um, I like to just remember that this is basically the inverse of our um, polynomials with odd powers. So thinking about the graph of y equals x cubed, and then considering the graph of y equals the cube root of x, those are just going to be our inverse functions. So if x cubed look like this, it makes a little bit of sense that cube root of x is the inverse graph. So mostly just getting comfortable with the shape of our functions. 
Next, we'll look at rationals, breaking these down as we've done the last few types um, by odd powers in the denominators versus even. And we'll just keep it simple and say 1 is sorry, in the numerator, and then the denominator is x to an odd power. When that's the case, you can see um, the pieces of the rational function will be opposite each other. So if there's a piece here, our other piece would be up top there. If we begin with a piece in the upper left, then we'd have a piece in the bottom right. A good uh, thing to remember about rationals is the vertical asymptotes being the value that the function never touches. So for example, if our function were 1 over x, we know the value of x that would make the denominator 0 is 0, therefore the domain would be all values of x as long as you don't include 0. So that's one thing to be careful about with rationals. Rationals where you have 1 over an even power just means that your pieces are doing the same thing. So we have either both pieces up top here or both pieces down low. Next, just peeking at exponential growth, um, and then we'll look at decay. So if we have um, a base greater than 1 to the power of x, the basic shape will look like the graph shown in red here. Just for interest, note the domain is looking like um, all real numbers. Oops, but the range will be from 0 to infinity. So you have a horizontal asymptote, in this case basically at 0. So that's for our exponential growth. For decay, the domain and range still the same, but it's just going to turn that graph around. So this is showing, sorry about that, um, things like population decay. Um, so the numbers are shrinking from left to right rather than growing. So the money growth was definitely this case here. And then the inverse of exponentials are our logarithms. So there's kind of a basic logarithmic graph. Since they're the inverse of exponentials, the domain now is from 0 to infinity because that was the range of exponentials. And the range is all real numbers. So take some time to think about inverse functions as needed. Now into trig, so our sine, cosine, tangent curves, as well as the reciprocal functions and the inverse functions, um, you hopefully feel fairly familiar with cosine and sine. But these values can be easily derived from the unit circle. So just to highlight a few points, the graphs that I have screenshotted on these slides are just shown with integer values on the tick marks. We know for graphing trig, um, radian values are going to make more sense, so I'll talk about that briefly. But if we think of our unit circle, and I focus just on a few points here, um, at 0 radians, the ordered pair would be 1, 0. At pi over 2 radians, the ordered pair would be 0, 1. At pi radians, the ordered pair is negative 1, 0. And then at 3 pi over 2 radians, the ordered pair is 0, negative 1. So again, unit circle implying radius of 1 allows us to understand that. So we had 0 radians, pi over 2 radians up top on our positive y-axis, pi radians on the negative x-axis, and then 3 pi over 2 radians on the negative y-axis. So when we talk about graphing the sine function, we're really just investigating the y values. So at 0 radians, the y value is 0. At pi over 2 radians, which is about 1.57, the y value is up to 1. So again, there's about 1.57 there. By pi radians, the y value is back down to 0. So pi is about 3.14 right there. And then by 3 pi over 2, the y value should be at negative 1. So that value of 3 pi over 2 being between 4 and 5 here. And then if you completed the whole circle, come back up to 2 pi, the y value is back to 0. So keep that in mind. Maybe go through that same exercise for cosine.
um, graphing sine and cosine are definitely things that could be asked of you in a calculus course. So the next page will be cosine. Uh, again, feel free to walk through the unit circle to verify these main points. And of course, sine and cosine really are the same graph, they're just shifted. So if we refer back to the sine curve we just looked at, if we were to shift this curve left by pi over 2, it would become the cosine curve we see on this page. And domain for sine and cosine would be all real numbers. The range would be from negative 1 to 1. So this is true for both sine and cosine. Okay. Tangent is, again, we probably know tangent as sine over cosine, and you can walk through the unit circle to derive this graph as well. For the sake of time, I'll just go ahead and highlight just a few things about the graph. Tangent is going to be undefined where cosine is equal to zero. And cosine is the x value on the unit circle. So the x value on the unit circle is zero at pi over two, and 3 pi over 2. And if we kept circling, it would be at every odd multiple of pi over 2. So that's where these vertical asymptotes are shown, just coming from those odd multiples of pi over 2. If we wrote out the domain for tangent, then it would be, we could say, all values of x such that x is not an odd multiple of pi over 2. So I'm going to write it this way. Um, pi over 2 and to get an odd number, I could take any even number, so 2 times any integer is even, and then add 1 to it. So I'm using n as an integer there. Range would still be, though, um, in this case, all real numbers. So that's tangent. The last few I won't talk as long about. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So to graph secant, it turns out you can actually take the graph of cosine and kind of work with um, the reciprocal of the pieces. So that's how we generate this graph here. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So cosecant is 1 over sine. So the sine curve can be used to generate the picture here. Cotangent being the reciprocal of Tangent tells us that cotangent of an angle is the same as cosine over sine. So this will be undefined wherever sine is zero. Sine is zero on our unit circle. Uh, that's going to happen at values like zero and pi and really any, any multiple of pi. So that's why on the graph here you can see a vertical asymptote at about 3.14, so there's our vertical asymptote at pi, here's the vertical asymptote at zero, the next one is coming up right here at 2 pi. So the domain for cotangent can be expressed as all values of x such that x does not equal to a multiple of pi. So I'm using n again as an integer here. Range, as with tangent, was negative infinity to infinity. All right, last thing, and then we'll quit here, is arctangent. So if our tangent graph looks like this, arctangent is the inverse of tangent. And if the asymptotes for tangent were at values like negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, those values become the horizontal asymptotes for the arctangent curve. So maybe one of the nicest things to know about this is the horizontal asymptotes. This actually gets into what I mentioned at the beginning, which is um, this is useful information when discussing limits. So a lot of information about graphs. Hopefully you feel pretty comfortable with some of that and study up on the shapes of your functions.